opportunity to uh, see all of you, a lot of former students in the crowd, and talk about my absolute most favorite things, bugs, insects. So I'm glad to see so many of you here uh, willing to spend your Friday night to listen to me talk about my most favorite thing. Uh, there's some 30,000 species of insects known in Texas. About 6,000 of those are uh, beetles, about 5,000 butterflies and moths. Those are pretty impressive numbers alone, but when you think and compare those to the number of species of mammals in the world, they're even more impressive. That's around 5,000. You consider there's less than 10,000 species of birds in the world, and they're even more impressive. In fact, insects are the most diverse terrestrial uh, group of animals on the planet. Some estimates range anywhere from 1 million to 30 million insect species out there. So like Larry said, I'm going to be working an awfully long time. Uh, they occupy every niche you can imagine in the terrestrial and freshwater environment, and they occupy every functional feeding group that you can imagine, from predators and parasites to uh, herbivores and scavengers. Uh, you can relax a little bit. I'm not going to talk about all 30,000 species uh, found in Texas tonight, although I probably could be coaxed into that with uh, little effort. But rather, I'm going to focus on some specific groups that are of particular interest to me, and hopefully will be to you. Well, hopefully. There we go. The famous evolutionary biologist J.B.S. Haldane uh, once found himself in the company of some theologians. And as the story goes, uh, he was having dinner with these clergy, and one of them turned to him and asked what he could tell about the Creator from, his, from studying his creation. His response, as it goes, was, that he had an inordinate fondness for beetles. And I can't think of a more appropriate response, given that there are more beetle species out there than any other group of, man of animals. In fact, a fourth of all described animal species are beetles. Uh, there have been some 365,000 species of beetles described since the beginning of our modern uh, system of nomenclature in 1758. If you do the math, that works out to about four species a day and we're continuing to describe species at an unprecedented rate. This is a, an exhibit that you can see over in the uh, Texas Memorial Museum, uh, basically showing you a, a small snippet of diversity seen in really a single family. This is primarily representing the family Scarabidae, a tremendously diverse group of beetles, which you'll hear a little bit more about tonight. And I encourage you to go over and visit the Texas Memorial Museum uh, great Natural History Museum here on uh, the University of Texas campus, if you haven't been there recently. Well, the second largest uh, group of insects belong to the order Lepidoptera, and they're the butterflies and moths. This is a group that I'm sure is familiar to many of you. The butterflies are the diurnal or day-flying counterparts that are often uh, very beautifully, brightly colored, uh, active flyers during the day. And the moths, typically the nocturnal counterpart, those that are flying at night, uh, are often uh, more drab in color, uh, often hairier, um, and often more robust abdomens. There are many neat and uh, very pretty uh, day-flying moths, though. And one way that you can tell these apart from butterflies, and sometimes it can be quite difficult, as my entomology students can tell you, uh, is to look at the antennae. Uh, butterflies will always have clubbed antennae like this. Uh, moths will have a variety of different types of antennae, but they'll never have these capitate or what we call clubbed uh, antennae that look just like this. Uh, scientists estimate anywhere from 112 to 165,000 species of butterflies and moths are uh, in the world. The far, third largest group of insects belong to the order Hymenoptera. And this is an extremely beneficial an important group includes things like the wasps, ants, and bees. Uh, this is an uh, extremely, again, important group as uh, all we all know, for example, bees make honey and wax. Uh, there are also a lot of uh, ants and parasitic wasps that are actually uh, enemies of pest insects, things like caterpillars that might munch on the crops that we are so dependent on. So these things are very beneficial in helping to control those pests. And this was discovered as far back as 4,000 years ago by the Chinese, when they would actually uh, take ants and encourage them to live on their fruit trees because they realized that this would actually increase their fruit yield. 
Probably the most important reason that this group is so important to us is because, of course, there are a lot of pollinators. Uh, they, we would not have the crops that we eat. We wouldn't have the crops that we feed our livestock uh, without uh, all of these pollinators. It also represents the group of insects uh, that basically exhibits what we call parthenogenesis in, in the greatest number. There are more individuals that basically can develop from an unfertilized egg in this group than in any other group of animals. So an extremely important and beneficial group. Well, we also have flies out there. Uh, a lot of insects are called dragonflies, butterflies. The term fly is used quite a bit, but there are, is a group of true flies that belong to the order Diptera. Uh, they take on any number of different shapes and forms, but you can recognize them fairly easily because they only have a single pair of wings. Whereas most, fly, uh, most insects have two pair of wings, flies have their hind pair of wings reduced to these little knob-like structures called halteres. So you can always recognize uh, a fly by the presence of just these two wings. This is a robber fly feeding on a bee. And again, they take on many different forms. Of course, flies are important because uh, they act, they, many of them uh, act as vectors for diseases of, uh, on crops and certainly diseases in man. Well, for most of you, I'm going to guess that a bug is something that stirs across the ground. You may not be quite sure what it is, and you may even have tendencies to want to step on it. Hopefully, after tonight, you'll, uh, those tendencies won't be there. But actually, there's a group of insects that are specifically called bugs, and they belong to the order Hemiptera. So basically, all bugs are insects, not all insects are bugs. Uh, this is a group of uh, tremendously diverse uh, insects that can be recognized by these pretty snazzy mouth parts. They're called piercing sucking mouth parts because they actually pierce tissues, both plant and animal, and then suck up fluids from those. Um, you can also recognize a large group of insect, a large group of these true bugs uh, because of their wings. Uh, this is a leaf-footed bug, and you'll notice that the uh, top part of the wing is actually uh, membranous while, or rather leathery, while the bottom part of the wing is uh, membranous. I'm starting to lose my pointer there. I don't know if we maybe have another one. Um, so this is uh, a group that you can recognize by these two things, these piercing, sucking mouth parts and these, um, well now Jay, I've got to figure out how to use it. Is that button right there? There we go. Uh, that, that'll work. So we can uh, recognize them by these half leathery and half membranous wings. Now most true bugs, uh, like this leaf-footed bug on, on the thistle here, actually feed on plants. But there are some bugs that are predators. Things like this assassin bug or wheel bug that you no doubt have seen locally that's a real common insect uh, found locally around Austin. Here it is feeding on a sphinx moth caterpillar. They take these piercing sucking mouth parts and pierce and then suck. And when you look at these uh, uh, under high magnification, you find out uh, that they are really quite spectacular. Uh, these are not knives from my kitchen, but rather high magnification SEMs of the stylets that make up these piercing sucking mouth parts. They have all sorts of serrated edges and sharp points. And this is one group of insects that you do have to be careful in handling. In fact, some of the predatory assassin bugs are vectors of diseases. They, f they think that, uh, for example, Charles Darwin probably ultimately died from Chagas disease that he contracted from an assassin bug. Well, the next group of insects that I want to talk about is one that I'm especially partial to, and those are the odonata. Uh, the term odonata uh, is derived from the Greek word odonto, which means tooth, and it refers to the large mandibles that, that uh, make up a significant part of a dragonfly's face. The odonata are the dragonflies and damselflies. These are two principal groups within this order. And they can be recognized fairly easily in the field by the shape of their wing and the way that they're held. So if we look at the damselfly up here, you'll see that the, all four wings are the same shape and that they're held over the abdomen uh, when at rest. Some damselflies confuse matters a little bit and will hold them at a slight angle. But for the most part, you'll see them holding their wings directly back over the abdomen. Dragonflies, on the other hand, will hold their wings stretched out away from the body. And you'll notice that the hind wing is much broader basally than the forewing. 
So these two things will help you differentiate between the damselflies and dragonflies that you see uh, flying around. For most people, uh, I find they think of damselflies as just a smaller version of a dragonfly. In fact, if we look at wingspan of our modern dragonflies, they range anywhere from about three-fourths of an inch to six inches. While damselflies can range anywhere from about a half an inch, really tiny, to seven and a half inches in the case of something like this big megaloprepis. So our largest odonates in terms of wingspan and abdominal length actually belong to the damselfly subgroup. Um, this does it, these are pretty big, impressive uh, damselflies, and I'm just wanting to show you here a little bit of the diversity in terms of size, shape, and color. But uh, if they pale in comparison to some of the uh, fossil ancestors of dragonflies that had wingspans in excess of 28 inches. These things lived around 250 to 300 million years ago, and I often fantasize about what it would be like to see them flying around today. Well, dragonflies and damselflies are often uh, wrapped into a lot of myths and folklore, especially in European culture. Uh, this probably has something to do with the, their rapid flight uh, and also perhaps their long abdomen, which is often misconstrued with having the ability to actually sting. It turns out that odonates are perfectly harmless. Uh, well, with the one exception, uh, I do know of a couple of instances where uh, someone canoeing or maybe rafting down a river has basically been, um, it turns into an oviposition site or an egg laying site. It turns out that some uh, large dragonflies will lay eggs just in uh, vegetation. And these are great insects, but they may not be the brightest in the world. Occasionally, they will mistake a leg or an arm for a piece of vegetation and try to slip an egg in there. Never had this happen uh, personally, but have been told it can be uh, painful. And this may well be where the idea that they sting came, came from. Uh, they are perfectly harmless. Uh, many of the names in folklore uh, have the connotations re referring to satanic, um, equestrian, or reptilian uh, uh, things, uh, coming up with names, sometimes even combining them, like devil's riding horse, for example. Uh, damselflies have been attributed with the ability to heal wounded serpents, uh, and thus given the name snake doctor. Uh, dragonflies, on the other hand, have been, uh, children have been told stories that they will come and sew up the eyes and ears of peacefully slumbering children. And that's the, the term uh, uh, devil's darning needle up here. So a lot of different terms that have been uh, credited to these insects over time. Uh, many of them, again, uh, with uh, some of these kind of neat uh, uh, words. Well, most of you are no doubt familiar with dragonflies and damselflies before you came in here. You see them flying around. I mean, they are, after all, one of the most impressive insects. But I bet you're not that familiar with the larval stage. In fact, that's the stage in which the uh, odonate spends the majority of its life. Around here, it may spend eight months or so, on average, as a larval odonate, and then only a month as an adult. They are aquatic, and they can be recognized because they have this fantastically um, uh, de designed lower lip or labial mask it basically has, is armed with teeth and spines and covers the face. Uh, sometimes it's, it is a spoon shaped like you can see here. Sometimes it'll have a long uh, kind of petiolate um, uh, part to it. But this is an easy way to recognize uh, this group. You can tell the difference between a damselfly and a dragonfly uh, immature uh, very easily by looking at the, uh, or looking for three caudal leaf-like gills uh, that you will see on damselflies. So you can see them here. Uh, these are used for respiration. Uh, the oxygen is dissolved out of the water into these gills. But it turns out that they're more important as rudders, basically allowing the damselfly to move more efficiently through the water. Such that uh, if the gills are actually amputated, this damselfly can still respire just fine uh, directly through these wing pads. Oxygen just diffuses right through there. Dragonflies, on the other hand, like this one, lack any external gills, uh, but rather have gills internally in the rectum. And you may think, well, that seems like a peculiar thing to do, but it actually proves to be fairly useful. What happens is water is siphoned in through the anus and over these rectal gills, oxygen is diffused out, and then that water can actually be expelled out forcefully out of the anus 
allowing the dragonfly to shoot across the water. Uh, you may have seen this out in one of the tanks. I've actually had dragonflies, uh, large dragonflies in tanks that could squirt water out of their anus several feet. Yes, I find this entertaining. Uh, you'll notice uh, this labial mask here and the teeth uh, associated with that. It gives you the idea that these are predators uh, and, certain, and they are uh, quite voracious predators. In fact, this is a movie uh, to show you a quick little idea of what a dragonfly can do to even something like a fish. This is an Anax junius, common green darner larva here. This is slowed down. You'll see that labial mask go out, grab its prey, bring it back in, and then start munching on it. This is a uh, time-lapsed video, uh, this portion as it munches down on that fish, uh, showing you, okay, showing you some, uh, uh, which takes place over probably about 20 minutes. It could devour that entire fish. In fact, dragonflies can be the top predators in ponds uh, that lack fish or that, uh, that's probably better, yeah, that lack fish completely or uh, has just small fish like these gambusia. I'll show you a couple of still photos uh, of this same dragonfly and the way it actually uses that labial mask. Uh, it's grabbing a hold of the fish uh, so that it can then munch on it with its mandibles. Um, I recently heard uh, someone make the comparison uh, of how this labium is pretty much like having a full set of silverware. Fork, spoon, uh, and knife all right there at the dragonfly's disposal and I thought that was pretty cool. I also, by the way, think it's pretty cool that an invertebrate here is munching down on a vertebrate. Well, dragonflies, of course, are tremendous uh, aerial uh, uh, flyers. They have uh, tremendous uh, acrobatic abilities in the air. They can reach maximum uh, flights in excess of 30 miles an hour. Uh, and they can uh, have sustained uh, foraging flights of four miles an hour. Uh, this is probably a good time to show you how they fit in with other insects in terms of uh, flight speed. Uh, it turns out that this is actually something that's very difficult to uh, calculate. Uh, and as a result, there are all sorts of numbers out there uh, reported in the, in the literature, sometimes in very reputable sources. Uh, for example, a uh, dipterist, someone who studies flies, was uh, working out in the mountains in New Mexico and witnessed a deer botfly going by him. And he estimated, doing some what he thought were fairly precise calculations, that this fly was traveling at about 400 yards per second. Well, this was picked up by the New York Times, it was published in a journal article, and quickly became the fastest insect known to man. Then somebody started looking at that a little bit closer, and it turns out that 400 yards per second is over 800 miles per hour. <laughs> And it turns out that that is faster than the speed of sound at 12,000 feet, uh, where he was in the mountains. And since no sonic boom was reported in the observation, it was guessed that this was probably a little bit of an overestimate. Um, also, a physicist looked at this and decided that it would actually be equivalent, a deer bot fly traveling some 800 miles an hour, if it hit you, would be like being shot. It would actually go right through you. And this is particularly disturbing when you consider that botflies are notoriously clumsy flyers and regularly run into walls and people and, and so on. Well, looking at that, uh, uh, that data, it basically came to a more conservative estimate of 20 miles an hour. So these numbers, uh, you know, are conservative, uh, but give you an idea of basically how insects fall in terms of their ability for flight. Uh, oftentimes, the fastest insect is reported as a sphinx moth, something like this white line sphinx feeding on the thistle here. These are day flying moths that move about very quickly. Certainly, you have the capability uh, to uh, have bursts of speed in excess of 30 miles an hour. Uh, they often uh, look like hummingbirds. They're moving around so quickly, feeding on flowers. Well, dragonflies aren't far behind that. Um, in fact, some large dragonflies may, may well be faster than that. Uh, other fast insects include things like migratory locusts uh, and, and deer flies. And then this gives you an idea of, some how, of how some of the other different insects fit in in terms of their uh, flight speeds. Well, one of the things that makes dragonflies such fantastic aerial 
uh, predators and, and acrobats is that they have tremendous vision. When you look at something like this common green darner's head, pretty much you see nothing but eye. Compound eyes making up a huge part of this head, they give us an almost 360 degree field of view. Uh, they can often be quite colorful, and you'll see these black areas in the eye that actually move as you look at the eye and move your position. Those are uh, areas that are basically absorbing the most amount of light, uh, and so therefore at the angle that you're looking, so therefore they kind of move around, and they represent the largest omatidia or individual facets in the eye and the, great, the area where the dragonfly has the greatest visual acuity. Dragonflies have the greatest vision of any insect with some 30,000 facets in some of the larger dragonflies, uh, giving them a tremendous ability, basically 30,000 individual images of whatever they're looking at. This is why they're so difficult to catch and why I love to send students out there uh, to try to catch them for me. Well, this also makes them exceptional predators as adults. Uh, I showed you what kind of predator they can be as a, as a larva. Uh, here's an example of the, uh, their predatory nature as an adult. This is one of our uh, more uncommon but attractive dragonflies in Texas, the blue-faced ringtail. And it's feeding on a uh, small damselfly here. The typical prey for dragonflies uh, is mosquitoes and other biting flies. Uh, black flies, things like that. So they're very beneficial uh, insects in that regard. But they can take bigger things. They can take uh, large butterflies, swallowtails, uh, damselflies as you see here, dragonflies, essentially they're, they're equal in size. And there actually have been a couple of confirmed reports of dragonflies catching and feeding on hummingbirds. And they'll catch them and take them to the ground and feed on them. So they're tremendous predators. Now, unfortunately, I don't have a shot of a dragonfly feeding on a hummingbird, but I can show you an example of how diligent they are as predators. This is a common green darner here that I saw take out a roseate skimmer, the other dragonfly, which is not that much smaller than the darner. Uh, after a, a slight mid-air tussle, uh, rustled it to the ground where they ended up essentially head first in a pile of mud. Well, came over to look at it and the dragonfly was feeding on the roseate skimmer like he didn't have a care in the world and all was right. I don't know whether he was actually going to be able to free himself from the mud. It's entirely possible that he could, but it gives you an idea just how diligent uh, a predator and how aggressive a predator they can be. But I did wonder if that was going to be his last meal. Well, they also are uh, capable of mating in air. Uh, this is a common sight that you may see around uh, ponds in the spring and summer in Texas. This is a pair of wandering gliders, uh, dragonflies that uh, are real common around here, uh, in what we call the wheel position, mating. Turns out that dragonflies are unique in the insect world and that they have a, the males of a pair of secondary copulatory structures just uh, behind the thorax on the abdomen. Well, what happens is uh, a male dragonfly uh, will uh, catch a female in midair. In a few groups, there's courtship, but in most groups, there's no really dating period. Um, and the male will just grab the female. If it's a dragonfly, he'll actually grab her head behind the eyes or on the eyes. And if it's a damselfly, a little bit gentler, will we'll grab uh, behind the head on the thorax. Well, just before or after the male grabs the female, uh, he will take the, uh, the tip of his abdomen and transfer sperm to these secondary copulatory structures just behind the thorax. Then the female will bring her abdomen up and connect to those structures, thus giving us this wheel position. Uh, they can fly like this actually quite well, but they typically, after they uh, form this position, will go find an area to perch and then uh, continue on with their business. Here are a few images to give you an idea of what this uh, uh, looks like and the differences in the different groups. This is our, a pair of ivory striped sylphs, uh, dragonflies, and you can see the male actually grabs the female again right on the eyes. In fact, larger dragonflies, you can actually see scars uh, from where the male has grabbed the female's eyes. Um, in damselflies, you'll see it's a little bit gentler. Uh, the male grabs the female behind the head on the thorax. Now, I've often thought it quite appropriate, the, uh, 
the image that uh, basically uh, develops uh, when damselflies are mating. Here's a close-up of uh, the female uh, connecting up and mating with the male in those secondary copulatory structures. Now, just like in humans, like with us, as we get older, we get white and gray hair. Uh, well, it turns out dragonflies, many of them, uh, do the same. They develop this waxy, white, or blue, what we call pruinescence or pruinosity over the entire body. Here is a bleached skimmer, and you can see this pruinosity developed over the body, but notice where it has been rubbed off. This actually gives us some sense of just what this guy's been up to, because notice what the female, where the female is hanging on to. Uh, we can actually gather that he's had a fairly, repro a fairly successful reproductive life uh, based on the amount of pruinosity rubbed off there. Well, there are, uh, it's a fairly competitive world out there. Dragonflies are constantly patrolling territories, competing with other males for the right to mate with a female. And uh, it's very important that they guard their investment uh, because some dragonflies and damselflies are actually known to be able to remove sperm previously deposited into a female uh, from another male. Uh, so this means it's probably pretty important to stay around and guard uh, the eggs that are going to be fertilized with your sperm. Here's an example of thread tails where the male stays attached to the female uh, while she's laying eggs into the uh, uh, vegetation here. Uh, some dragonflies will uh, release the female but hover nearby to fend off others that will be coming in, other males, and others will perch nearby to fend off approaching uh, and intruding males. Now, occasionally, uh, this male will find himself uh, basically uh, lost to, to uh, predation by maybe a lizard or something like that. Uh, here you can see the abdomen of a male minus the thorax uh, and the head. Now, this is not good for the male, uh, but it turns out that at least no other male is going to be able to mate with that female. <laughs> not a, a common occurrence, but I have seen it more than once. And it gives you an idea of just what kind of linkage, uh, how strong a linkage uh, the male uh, has grabbing a hold of the female. Well, here are a pair of common green darners laying eggs. Uh, you can see, again, the male... Uh, grabbing a hold of the female, guarding those eggs, making sure that no other males are going to come around. Here's what the eggs look like that are deposited into uh, vegetation. They're basically cigar shaped. A single female can lay anywhere from a hundred to a couple of hundred to even a thousand eggs in a single mating. Some damselflies will actually submerge as they go down a stem to lay eggs and they've been reported to uh, stay under without resurfacing, completely submerged underwater in excess of 100 minutes. And that's pretty impressive that a number of species are capable of doing that. Well, you probably thought I was going to talk about dragonflies all night, right? Uh, another group of insects that I'm very uh, interested in are the dung beetles. Uh, as Larry said, I grew up on a horse farm watching dung beetles constantly, and they have always fascinated me. They're probably the first insects uh, that were ever considered divine. Uh, the ancient uh, Egyptians worshipped these. They looked at a uh, tumble bug rolling a dung across uh, a dung ball across the substrate or the ground and made the analogy that it was like their sun god rolling the sun across the horizon. You can see um, just how uh, important dung beetles were in Egyptian culture when you look at some of their art. Here's an example of the god Osiris here depicted in the shape of a scarab larva. Arising from Osiris is his son Horus, the sun god, and you notice that the shape of his arms there are very similar to what the four legs of a scarab beetle, a dung beetle, might look like. And they're both encapsulated in, in a dung ball. Um, the Egyptians considered dung beetles uh, to represent rejuvenation and renewal as well. So this is a really neat uh, group of insects. There we go. Um, you might think that eating dung is kind of an odd thing to do, uh, especially if you consider the nutritional aspects of it. I mean, presumably anything that has been eaten by another organism, what comes out is waste, there's probably not a whole lot there that can be consumed of nutritional value. 
In fact, it's not the dung itself that the beetles are feeding on. Rather, it's the microbial community associated with the dung uh, that the beetles are eating. Uh, there have only been a couple of studies to address this, but those that have been done actually indicate that about 90% of what a dung beetle eats turns out to be dung beetle dung. Uh, so again, it's the microbial community uh, that the uh, insects are actually feeding on. Uh, luckily, of course, there's no shortage uh, of dung out there. In fact, uh, because the beetles not only feed on the dung, but also breed in the dung, it turns out to be a very valuable resource and a lot of competition occurs. Um, in East Africa, it's common to have some 4,000 beetles coming to a, a dung uh, pad from an elephant in less than half an hour. Uh, one investigator found 16,000 beetles on a dung uh, pad from an elephant weighing three pounds uh, was completely gone in a matter of less than two hours. The dung beetles themselves weighed over a pound. So it's a very uh, precious resource for a lot of different uh, dung beetles and other insects as well. Well, once you get past the whole idea of eating dung, then you have to find it. Uh, and this can be kind of difficult if you think about a small insect flying through uh, the environment uh, trying to find dung that has been presumably randomly dropped around. But it turns out that dung beetles have exceptionally good uh, antennae for doing this. You can see on this phaneus, these antennae are capable of discerning the smallest differences in the chemical cocktails that result from the decomposition of a dung. In fact, they can tell differences uh, in terms of the species uh, of, that left the dung. And so some species of dung beetle are specific to certain species of dung. Well, they also have specialized mouth parts. Because they're feeding on that bacteria, they actually slurp up the dung, uh, getting those bacteria. You can see here the mouth parts looking kind of interesting. Uh, you can actually hear this. Next time you're out in, uh, let's say, a cow pasture, bend your ear down near the cow patty. And you'll hear oftentimes a lot of slurping going on if there are a number of dung beetles there. You actually don't have to be that close if there are a number of beetles. You really can hear it. Well, dung beetles are so important that a fellow by the name of Fincher uh, in the early 80s, 1981, actually attributed an economic value to the dung beetles. He did this by looking at the number of cattle that were around, some 96 million uh, at that time. He said, okay, well, one cow pat takes up the area of about 0 0.08 square meters. Given that most cows defecate eight times a day or so, or ten times a day or so, that would result in dung covering some 5,000 hectares of pasture per day. You extrapolate that out, that's two million hectares of pasture per year. Now, Fincher was a good scientist, and he actually made corrections for uh, dung that was buried. Uh, as well as uh, like cattle and feedlots and things like this. And he came up with a more conservative number of over 300,000 hectares per year of pasture covered by dung. If there was nothing there to clean it up. Well, this is a significant number because this represents pasture loss that cattle could graze on. And more importantly, it represents uh, potential breeding sites for flies, uh, gastrointestinal parasites that already cost the cattle industry billions of dollars. So based on that area lost and the uh, parasites that could result, he figured that dung beetles actually contributed in excess of $2 trillion, $1980 trillion, uh, to the economy each year. Very important insects. Well, given that uh, dung, I've explained, is a valuable resource, there are a lot of beetles and other insects trying to come to it, uh, there's a lot of competition that results. And it should be no surprise that uh, these beetles will try to take the dung in different ways. In fact, there are three different primary ways in which beetles will uh, come to dung and take it away, or rather deal with it. Let's see if we can... Well, there we go. The first group are what we call dwellers. These are uh, small beetles that will come in and they'll actually just dive right into the dung pad itself and feed and breed on the pad itself. The second group are the tunnelers. These come in, they'll take a, a, a piece of dung and they'll actually bury it beneath the pad. The third group 
but probably the one that you're most familiar with. Come on, third group. This button up here has been a little... Well, just try... There we go. The third group are the rollers. Uh, these are beetles, they're sometimes called tumblebugs. They come in and they will actually roll the dung away from uh, the pad itself. So there's different ways in which these beetles will come to and approach a dung pad. This may have completely died on me here. Uh, if we look at each of these groups in a little bit more detail, the dwellers uh, are primarily a group of scarabs called the, uh, belonging to the subfamily Aphodiini. Uh, they're small beetles, just a couple of millimeters in size, and they actually just, again, dive right into the mound and breed and feed right there in the dung pad. The second group, the tunnelers, not only make what we call food balls, but they also make brood balls. So they're making balls of dung that they feed on, and then they make brood balls that they actually lay an egg in, and then the larva hatches and starts to feed. Uh, they will come in and they will take these brood balls and they will bury them beneath the uh, pad. Uh, sometimes they will be just right at the surface underneath the pad. Other times, like in some geotrupid beetles, it may be several feet down below. Even something like a small anthophagus, something like this one or this one, they're less than a quarter of an inch in size, uh, will bury dung like a half a foot or more below the pad. These dung, uh, brood balls uh, can be placed tightly together. There can be one. There can be multiple ones. They can be loosely uh, together. It can be arranged in different ways depending upon the species that you're talking about. And in many cases, you will have a female that will actually tend to the brood ball, stay in the chamber with the brood ball, cleaning, making sure there aren't any parasites, uh, and tending to the brood ball while the young feed on it. The third group of beetles are, again, the tumble uh, bugs or the rollers, and they will come in and actually form a ball. Uh, the initial brood ball is, is uh, initiated by uh, either, either sex, a male or a female, but only one of the two initiates the making of the brood ball. Then the other one will come in and will uh, start to help out, finish up the ball, and then they will roll it away. Uh, they do this typically by pushing uh, their forelegs on the ground and their hind legs on the dung. Sometimes the, the both sexes will help roll it. They can do this at fairly fast speeds, if you've ever seen them doing this. Other times the female decides, well, I think the male is capable of this, and she'll just basically hang on to the dung ball and gets rolled right along with it <laughs> by the male. There's another group of uh, rollers that are called kleptoparasitic beetles, klepto, kleptoparasitic scarabs. They come in and they actually try to steal that ball from these beetles. So you've got a lot of competition going on uh, for this valuable resource that the larvae need uh, to breed in. And in fact, this competition has resulted uh, very clearly in the evolution of these different breeding behaviors that I just discussed. You can see here that dwellers are certainly going to be confronted with competition both as adults and larvae for food and space. They are breeding uh, right in the dung pad itself, and so they're having to compete with all the other beetles that are there. Tunnelers uh, do away with competition for the larvae by removing that brood ball and actually burying it, right? So the larvae are actually in an isolated chamber and don't have to, to uh, deal with competition from other beetles. Rollers, on the other hand, have taken it a step further and they've removed competition uh, for space in the adults by actually removing the brood ball away from the dung pad itself. So it's a really neat example how you can see competition for this resource uh, over time has led to these different types of breeding behaviors. Now there are lots of other things associated with these dung beetles. Many of them are what we call phoretic. That means that they basically attach themselves to the beetle, uh, don't actually feed on it, but basically use it like a big taxi cab. Uh, basically something for uh, transportation. They're small, they can't move very far at long distances. So things like these mites will be phoretic on dung beetles, and you'll see them oftentimes just attaching themselves in order to get to another area. Another group of phoretic insects associated with these dung beetles uh, belong to the family Spherocerity. And these are really neat flies. They're called, sometimes the entomologists aren't very original, they're called small dung flies. <laughs> they actually uh, will attach themselves to the back or the pronotal shield of the beetle, 
They will breed and carry on their activities all attached to this beetle. The reason for this is that they actually feed and uh, breed in dung as well. And it turns out, and this might not be any surprise to you, that dung beetles are actually kind of messy eaters. Uh, in fact, uh, lots of dung gets basically pushed aside, and that's the dung that these flies will lay their eggs in and they will then feed on. Some of these flies will actually follow or stay attached to the dung beetle as it tunnels down below uh, so that they're actually entombed, uh, imprisoned, if you will, uh, in the chamber uh, that the dung beetle makes. Now, this is great because it means they don't have to worry about uh, predators and things like that harassing them. Uh, but, of course, it also means they literally are in prison until the dung beetle uh, leaves. They cannot get out of that chamber with, until the dung beetle itself leaves. Well, another group of organisms that I'm really fascinated with are scorpions. Now, I know scorpions aren't insects, but any good entomologist has to know and like arachnids, and I certainly do. Uh, we live here in the south, and so there are lots of scorpions, and I thought it would be something that uh, uh, people would be interested in hearing about. This is one of our common scorpions around here associated with caves. You can tell it's an insect because it has uh, four pair of legs. Uh, scorpions have this five-segmented tail with this very prominent stinger, and of course these pedipalps or uh, pincer-like structures that they use to grab prey with. Now, scorpions are really cool. One of the neat things about them is that they fluoresce under UV light. Nobody really knows why this happens. But the entire body, with the exception of the tip of the stinger and the eyes, will fluoresce under UV light. Fossil scorpions fluoresce under UV light. Dead scorpions fluoresce under UV light. Even scorpions that have been preserved in alcohol fluoresce under UV light. Even the alcohol that the scorpions were preserved in fluoresce under UV light. The only thing that doesn't fluoresce is the first instar of the scorpion. Again, nobody really knows why this is, but a couple of hypotheses have been uh, put out there. Uh, one is that uh, although scorpions can't see very well, uh, their eyes are capable of uh, discerning contrast-enhanced images. And so it may be a way that scorpions can basically find each other. They can uh, see themselves very contrastedly against their environment, their background, and possibly see themselves for mating purposes or to stay away from one another so that they don't get eaten. The other suggestion is a little bit more enticing, and that's that maybe it actually attracts other insects. It attracts insects. Uh, if you ever go to uh, a gas station and you see a mercury vapor light going, right, or you just look at what I'm doing on most Saturday nights, I'm around a mercury vapor light watching all the insects that are drawn in or attracted, right? Well, it may be that scorpions actually are attracting their prey uh, through this reflection, and that's a pretty nifty trick. This isn't known for sure, but it is one uh, suggested possibility. Now, scorpions are nocturnal, and the reason for that is that they are associated very strongly with dry, uh, deserty, uh, arid types of situations. So they're active during the cooler, uh, moister periods of the day, at night. You can very clearly see, just looking at the species that we have in Texas, uh, how strongly tied they are to these dry, arid conditions. There's only a single species in Texas found throughout the entire state. And that's this one, Centroides vitatus, the striped bark scorpion. You've no doubt encountered this one crawling into your house, seen it on your walls before. You maybe even have been unfortunate enough to encounter one in a shoe. Uh, it's a very common scorpion that we have uh, locally. Well, it's not until you move further west and get into the Austin area that you pick up another species, the pseudo Eurocnus that I mentioned earlier, associated with caves. And then you have to go into further into West Texas before you pick up the remaining 16 or so species out of the 18 that we have in Texas. Uh, for example, in Fort Davis, there's some eight species of scorpion known. Uh, you can find 14 species in Big Bend National Park. So just looking at our scorpions in Texas, you can get a really good idea how strongly tied they are to these dry, arid conditions. Now, I mentioned that scorpions uh, don't have very good vision. Uh, in fact, uh, they do have a number of eyes. They have a pair of median eyes, and they have three to five pair of lateral eyes. They don't form very good images, per se, uh, but they are capable of detecting light, and they are capable of discerning contrast-enhanced images. 
Rather, because they're moving around at night, and vision's probably not all that important, they rely on sensory hairs that are found all over the legs uh, and uh, pedipalps, those big pincers of the scorpion. These sensory hairs are capable of detecting the smallest changes or differences in uh, pressure uh, and air being blown over the scorpion. So this is the way in vibrations, this is the way, uh, one of the ways in which they are able to detect prey um, around. Now, another way is uh, using these pectines or comb-like structures that they have just behind the last pair of legs. They basically move back and forth and detect vibrations of uh, different types of prey. Now we all know that predators, I mean that scorpions are predators. And in fact, they use their stinger to be able to catch prey. When something comes in, they actually sting it. Most scorpions are actually sit and wait predators. They'll wait for something to come in. The scorpion will sting their prey and then they'll start to feed on it with these big chelicery, uh, pardon me, big pedipalps or pincers. It turns out that the smaller the scorpion is, the more dependent it is on the toxin. This guy's starting to get loose. Everybody stay put if that happens. Uh, the smaller scorpions are the ones that are more dependent upon their toxin and their venom. Uh, they're the ones that are more toxic and the ones you have to be more careful about. A big scorpion like this, an emperor scorpion, basically the largest living, living scorpions, uh, is not very aggressive. Uh, not prone to sting because it uses these big uh, pincers to grab its prey rather than the stinger itself. So when you see people laying down in a big vat of these things on Fear Factor, you know it's really not any big deal. By the way, we have one out set up out front for any of you that would like to try. Scorpions also have a really neat uh, way of courtship. Uh, once we get back here, we're trying all this fancy technical stuff, so, there we go. Uh, scorpions uh, go through this elaborate courtship that may last a day or more, where the male will find the female, they'll grab very gingerly the, each other's uh, petty pal pincers, and they'll do this courtship dance that again can last 24, 36 hours even. Uh, once the male fertilizes the female, uh, a gestation period of many, many months can occur uh, while these uh, baby scorpions are basically developing in kind of pseudo-placental sacs. They're born live, they come out, and they actually crawl on top of the uh, mother scorpion until their first molt. This provides them a, quite a bit of protection, but they have to leave rather quickly after that first molt because then they become lunch. Well, I can't very well have a talk entitled The Good, The Bad, and The Ugly and not talk about fire ants, right? Uh, Saul Wernick is certainly not the only person uh, to use fire ants as a focal point for a horror story. In fact, I imagine most of us in here uh, have our own horror stories attributed to fire ants. In fact, when we talk about fire ants, most of the time we're talking about red imported fire ants. We have native species I'm showing you here a comparison of our native red fire ant with the red imported fire ant. And they are very similar, but there are some differences you can tell. Uh, our native fire ants on the right here is generally a little bit larger. They have larger heads as well. You'll notice that the abdomens are red, while the imported fire ant tends to have a blacker abdomen. You can also sometimes, I don't know if you can make it out in here, but sometimes you can pick up on ridges uh, uh, basically on the head of, the, of our native ant. So there, we have native fire ants. They're really not the problem. It's these red imported fire ants that we always are complaining about and are the, the focal point of these horror stories, if you will. Well, the reason that the red imported fire ant is such a problem is because it has undergone what we call ecological release. Here you see a queen uh, tending her brood uh, and being tended to by a number of workers. Uh, ecological release means that this species is a release from competitors and predators, and so it's able to basically completely take over an area, not have to worry about anything uh, uh, preying on it. There's basically nothing to keep it in check. Well, this results in a number of headlines, 
Uh, things like this, of course, they uh, it can be uh, quite destructive to our native fauna. Uh, they have outcompeted many species. Many species of not only insects, but also vertebrates have basically been lost or at least seriously impacted to these um, red imported fire ants. They can kill. Uh, every once in a while, uh, there are fatalities that are attributed to these things. Uh, sometimes, uh, even from as few as a single sting. Of course, this is really rare and happens when somebody is hypersensitive to the toxin and goes into anaphylactic shock. But nonetheless, they are a serious problem. For most of us, it's just an issue of you know, having multiple bites and you know, a few four-letter words. Well, the red imported fire ant was introduced in Mobile, Alabama around 1920 or so. We don't exactly know when. Uh, but we think of probably from uh, dirt that was brought in from South America, these big ships, barges coming from South America, using dirt as ballast, basically adding weight to the ship. Uh, the dirt was removed with the ants, tossed onto the shores there in, in Mobile, and from that point forward, the ants were able to spread. And you can see here, over time, how they have basically taken over and uh, moved north and westward. Now they are even known as far west as New Mexico, Arizona, and California, and even as far north uh, as, as northern Oklahoma, uh, even though I'm not showing that to you on this map. Um, the, I mentioned to you that the native fire ants are really not a problem, and the reason for that is that they have natural set of pests here to keep, or uh, rather not pests, natural set of enemies here uh, to keep them uh, in check and keep them under control. Here's an example. This is a uh, forward fly, which you can see right here, a very tiny fly attacking one of our native fire ants. Uh, these flies come in. They will actually lay an egg in the thorax. That egg will hatch and the larva will move through the body, making its way to the head capsule, where it will start to eat the entire contents of the head capsule until the head basically is decapitated and falls off. Now, as pretty of an image as this is, it's not really the individual ants that are killed uh, that, where these flies are making their greatest impact. Rather, it's in the behavior that is solicited by these flies. Um, if you notice, all of these ants in the photo here are basically showing a very defensive posture raising their abdomens up, trying to fend off this fly. Uh, when they're worrying about fending off uh, a fly like this, they don't have time to forage and carry about their natural, uh, normal duties. And this keeps them basically from growing and expanding at the rate that they would otherwise do. The problem with the red imported fire ant is that we have no natural pest to keep it in check. If you go to Argentina, South America, where these imported fire ants are native, and you kick open a mound, you'll find that the ants uh, will basically start to rebuild and go back into, under very quickly. Whereas here, of course, you kick open a mound, what happens? Thousands and thousands of ants come out, they stream up your legs, start biting you like crazy, right? There's nothing here to keep them in check. So researchers like Dr. Larry Gilbert are working on ways to bring these um, uh, flies uh, from South America here and releasing them to hope, in hopes that they will actually control uh, these imported fire ants. And he's having a fair amount of success, actually. So we'll keep our fingers crossed that uh, that, that sex, uh, success continues. <laughs> well, the last uh, group of insects I want to talk about are the green lace wings. Uh, this is a group that are incredibly attractive uh, adults. You've probably seen them around your porch lights or around vegetation. They belong to an order of insects that are characterized by these gorgeous, beady-like uh, wings. Now, as pretty as this green lace wing is, it's really the larvae that fascinates me. The larvae, I think, are equally as beautiful, uh, colorful, and they have these big tufts of hair. Uh, looking at it, you probably think, yeah, that's going to be a predator. It's got these fairly uh, prominent sickle-shaped mandibles. In fact, they have a voracious appetite for aphids. So they're called aphid lions. But it turns out that aphids actually associate themselves with ants. The ants will feed on the, the honeydew, sugary secretion or waste product of the aphid, and in return, the ants will protect the aphids from predators like these aphid lions. So something like this aphid lion can't just go in and start feeding on aphids without being attacked by ants. To combat that, 
they actually go around sticking debris, or in this case, in an insect graveyard, all on those tufts of hair, camouflaging themselves. You can see bits and pieces of spider and beetles up here. Here's the underside of that larva. It actually camouflages them so that they can get past those ants and then voraciously feed on the aphids. Here's an example of one that actually has covered itself with lichen and it's moving up and down the tree without being harassed by the ants. Very cool behavior, I think. Now, just as the aphid lions are predators, they have to face predation. And so they've overcome that with their eggs in a very novel way. Uh, instead of just laying their eggs directly on a piece of plant or on the ground, they actually lay them on a stalk a real long stalk with the egg right on top, on, in this case, on the spine of an apuntia or a cactus. This is so that roving uh, predators moving along here uh, are unable to, uh, to grab and feed on these eggs. So pretty, uh, pretty cool trick. Well, I could go on and talk about insects all night, but uh, we are out of time, and so I want to leave you with the idea and hopefully a greater appreciation for this amazing and fantastically diverse group of animals and with the idea that you, you've got a laboratory in your backyard. Um, just go out some time and take a look at the wonderful diversity of organisms that are right there outside of your back door. We're lucky in Texas to, be, to have so many different species um, right here and I just encourage you to observe and watch this wonderful group of organisms. With that, I'd like to thank several people who I wouldn't be able to put this talk on without, so I owe them a great debt of gratitude. Thank you very much. You want to hold the scorpion? a little something added. <laughs> These are banana nut muffins with mealworms baked into them. They're very tasty. <laughs> They're a little fat, that's right. So these are banana nut muffins with mealworms mixed in. Lizards and snakes with them.
Jonathan Scott, and you have here. So these are uh, super worms. These are a large. Yeah, I can get those on the video. <laughs> My hands are clean, I promise. Uh, these are large uh, tenebrionid, tropical tenebrionid beetles. There we go. <laughs> and they're actually quite tasty. <laughs> they have a bit of a ding to them, a squirt, if you will, when you first eat them, but they're very good. <laughs> now, I, I should point out my lab manager over here told me that people would eat anything if it was fried or ranch. So I decided ranch dip. Just like <laughs> things, um, you know, around about the finals time, uh, and force them to eat, otherwise they don't pass the class. <laughs> kind of mean that way. Oh, <laughs> My wife made these, and they're fantastic. They're chocolate chip cookies with crickets. <laughs> she baked them, but I could not get her to eat one. <laughs> Something told me these would be popular, so uh, I've got more. Welcome to come by at, uh, after we take some questions. Now these, yes, these are wow. 
waxworm critter. A uh, waxworm is a moth larva that commonly inhabits uh, a beehive uh, and the larvae. Uh, sometimes people think they look somewhat like an agate. Uh, they're uh, quite flexible. And uh, one of my students' moms made these. The so waxworm critters. They are absolutely fantastic. And they're warm. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you. 
curious, first of all, uh, it's no surprise to me that so many people were interested in eating these things. I mean, insects are fantastic in every way. Why shouldn't we eat them? But I have a question. How many of you didn't want to try any of these? Can you raise your hand? How many of you had some of the juice that was outside of the net? It turns out that this juice is colored with an insect called a cochineal insect. It's the white, in, uh, cottony looking insect that you see all over prickly pear cacti. So even if you didn't want to, you may have had a little bit of insect tonight. <laughs> So in recognition of that, we are bringing in this outstanding outreach lecture of work, which is the work that got out of recognition of the God of the contribution for the good, the bad, and the ugly effects of the day, April 23rd, 2004. Uh, that's just a certificate. We're also got this. <laughs> That's great. The only one, the only one left in town. <laughs> Went to every Tuesday morning at every garden. <laughs> <laughs> I had to buy out someone who bought the last one. <laughs> well, I think with that, go will probably be happy to answer a couple of questions. Yes. I had a question. I was told at one point that when fire ants come on you, that uh, you swap them and release like the formic acid, and that's what triggers the other ones to start fighting anything. Well, many social insects like ants will have pheromones, uh, things like alarm pheromones, certainly will have yeah, trigger basically uh, reaction, in this case, to stinging. So that's absolutely true. That's why, you know, it's not like one sting and another. Oftentimes, uh, even when one will bite you, even a sting, even if you have a split stick, it's releasing an alarm pheromone that can tell others to do the same thing. Yes. Three kinds of dung beetles found in Texas? Oh, absolutely. In fact, all of those photos of dung beetles are Texas natives and things that you can find right around this area. That's a bad finding. <laughs> Best way of finding a dung beetle? Do you really want to know? Uh, seek out dung. Uh, and uh, if you will take a shovel and dig beneath, uh, you will find a lot of those tumblers in many cases. But you will have to go fairly deep sometimes. Uh, actually, what entomologists will do to attract them is 
uh, bait for dung beetles. They're basically setting pitfalls with dung baited, and that brings them in, and then you don't have to dig them out, basically. So a little bit easier. Yes? I had a, a mealworm in my classroom to feed my lizards, and um, I left them in a container, and they went into the white uh -huh. There were beetles in there, and you know, and this would be a complete cycle, but then the beetles disappeared. How did that happen? Uh, you just, I mean, you, you mean they just can say die or they like completely disappear? Do you still have the larvae? Yes. Uh, the larvae will gnaw on different things, and so it may be that the larvae were basically breaking down the, the exoskeleton. You should see pieces of beetle in there, but it may be that they were basically crawling around in there and feeding, breaking down the, the entire beetle itself. They can't fly. In fact, mealworm beetles, the adult mealworm beetles, are kind of like the kangaroo rats of the insect world. Uh, they live in bran, uh, very dry uh, seed types of things like that. They don't need any moisture. They can actually extract all the moisture they need right out of the bran itself. So they're uh, pretty impressive that way. Yeah. Yes? Um, if a scorpion um, stings you, is it like a poison, sir? It's not sort of, it is a poison, yes. Uh, it's a neurotoxin. Uh, and some scorpions, uh, roughly around 20 species in the world, are known to be fatal. Uh, so you don't want to just go around picking up scorpions like I did. Uh, you need to know what scorpion you're dealing with, and especially the small one, you need to be really careful because they're the ones that are the most poisonous. Yes? Do you have a favorite insect in life? Do I have a favorite insect in life? You know, uh, I've been asked that before, and I'm... I'm not sure I always give the same answer, but at the moment I would say it's the one I haven't found yet. Um, I'm always out there interested in looking for different things, and so every time I take students out on a trip, you know, I find new things, and that's what really gets me excited. So the one I haven't found yet. Yes? How fast do these species appear to be evolving over the uh, well, that can really depends on the species that you're talking about, the group that you're talking about. I mean, you can actually get Drosophila flies to evolve in a laboratory situation, for example, while other things, you know, uh, you can't really see any evolution occurring in our time frame, in our scale. So that's a really difficult question to answer, and it really depends upon specific taxa that you're looking at. How about cockroaches? Um, well, cockroaches are actually what we call very evolutionarily conserved. Um, when you look at fossil roaches that are hundreds of millions of years old, they look exactly like the ones we have today. So there are different, there's evolution occurring on a micro level, but you don't have, you know, it's like it's morphing into something else. Um, cockroaches actually are very evolutionarily conserved, looking very much like their, their ancestors. Yes? What is your favorite tasting insect? <laughs> <laughs> That's a good question. Actually, dragonfly larvae are very tasty. Uh, I'm not sure whether it's uh, their predators, but it may be the algae that sometimes it grows on them. I don't know. But dragonfly larvae, uh, if for no other reason, because they're dragonflies. <laughs> yes? I recently got an email that had an image of a huge, what they call a camel spider. From Iraq. Iraq. Yeah. Now, what's the biggest insect? Okay, well, first of all, those are not insects. Like the scorpions, those are arachnids, and they're called sun spiders or sulfuges. And I've seen that image, and they can get very big. In fact, in Texas, we have some that, you know, are easily the size of my fist or the size of that scorpion that I was holding when you get into South Texas. Um, but I think that was a little bit of a camera angle. I don't know if it was intentional or not, but it wasn't quite the size of, you know, they basically made it look like one was this size up against his leg. And I think it was a little bit of either deliberate or unintentional trickery going on there. But they can get very large. Your actual question, maybe, what was the largest insect? Um, longest insect or walking six you find in Australia. Uh, biggest insect in terms of bulk, big beetles, uh, serendipid or longhorn beetles that you find in South America, which literally are the size of my fist. And goliath beetles rival those. These are big beetles you find in Africa. Yes? Are you familiar with vinegaroons? Of course, yeah. What are they? They are another group of arachnids called um, uh, tailless whip, or, uh, pardon me, they're called whip scorpions. And basically, they're not venomous. Uh, unlike scorpions, they're not venomous. They're, they simply what they do is they whip that tail around and they will expel a acetic acid or vinegary solution that basically is meant to be defensive. But they're actually not poisonous. And you can handle those and, and play with them all you want. They're great pets. Uh, 
Yeah. Um, now, you're sure you're not talking about maybe a tailless whip scorpion? Uh, the vinegar rooms themselves, are these things that are running on the ground or on walls? Mm-hmm. Okay. Uh, I've never had a vinegar room chase me, but, uh, and they're, they're, I mean, they're harmless. You can pick them up, play with them, but they will secrete that acetic acid, you know, uh, spray, which you don't want to get in your eyes or anything like that. But they're actually very harmless. Yeah. Yes, we have them in Texas. We have them out in West Texas. Uh-huh. Yeah, fairly large. <laughs> Maybe somebody, has anybody have a question over here? Yes. Could you just talk a little bit about think bugs and why they think? Sure. Uh, in fact, uh, of the many things that I probably meant to say and didn't during the lecture, it's that uh, hemiptera, one of the things that characterizes them is that many groups have scent glands. Uh, in the nymphs, they're actually located on the abdomen, and in the adults, they're on the thorax. Not all of them, but many of them do. And uh, these are basically just uh, defensive secretions that smell, they're noxious, and they fend off potential predators. And stink bugs, we've just given the particular name to it. But uh, the big leaf-footed bugs that we have around, they uh, will emit uh, a noxious smell. Uh, many, in fact, most hemiphrins will have scent glands. And actually, while we've been tasting things, if you, uh, you can actually like, pick up a big stink bug and... Uh, put the, the shoulder or the thorax area to your tongue and it's kind of a stinging sensation. Uh, that secretion that they're, uh, uh, I mean, it's a pleasant stinging, not like, you know, you're writhing in pain or anything. Um, but you can, uh, it's the chemical that they're expelling out. Yes? When the female flies are mating in the position, who directs flight? Uh, actually, it's the male that's directing the flight, but uh, the female is cooperating in terms of wing movement. How exactly they do that, it's unclear to me. And they're not, uh, uh, you know, they're not especially great while flying in, t- in, in a wheel position like that, but it's the male that's directing the, the movements, basically, and carrying the brunt of the load, if you will. Yes? Uh, bringing the predator of the non-native uh, fire in to Texas or to the um, infested areas, right. what kind of risk is introduced for that um, species? Yeah, excellent question. Anytime you're introducing a species, you want to be very cautious. I mean, that's why we have the problem we do, even though it was an accidental introduction with the, with the imported fire in. Um, so you have to do uh, species specificity tests, basically making sure that the species you're introducing before you introduce it is going to be specific on the target species you're interested in. And in the case of these forward flies, the reason that they, the forward fly that attacks our native species doesn't attack uh, the imported one is because it is species specific. So they're very specific, sometimes not just even within a species, but size classes within a species. Specific flies can be, can be that, have that specific uh, requirement. So, um, the, you know, you basically do tests to make sure that you're not going to be introducing something in the environment that could have other, impl- you know, problems down the road. It, but it has happened. Do they have um, any kind of bad behaviors? Like, is that predator in itself maybe a species? Are we talking yeah. specifically about the fly, the forward fly? Do they have any bad behaviors? Um, I think at this point, they, you know, they are just what you would want as a biocontrol in measure. That is, they have uh, a specific species that they're wanting to, to, to target and really have very little effects outside of that. Yes? Do these animals or insects with large eyes also have large brains? Actually, uh, insects have a, a brain that's divided into three regions and it's basically nothing more than a, a ganglion uh, you know, a bunch of ganglia uh, basically pulled together. Um, they're called the brains, the fore, middle, and hind brain. But uh, I can't say for sure whether insects that have, for example, greater vision necessarily have bigger brains. I think that there might be some differences there, certainly, but nothing really substantial. Um, okay, sure. Anyone cell phone? Okay. Okay. <laughs> yes. The down there. Who? Where? Right here. Okay. Um, what? This is my question. It's like something weird, kind of weird that happened in my class once. We had like a little cage and we played tarantula in and lots of fire ants. And um, when the bell rang, we went home and when we came to school the next day, um, didn't go special right away because the fire ants were like crawling all over the tarantula and they had broken off. And like a leg had fallen off, and some were like biting the leg, and some were biting 
So why the tarantula? Yeah, fire ants are extremely vicious. Uh, they can actually kill fawns, baby deer, uh, young cattle that are basically anything that can't get off of the ground. If you lay there long enough and don't get up, they'll attack you. Um, they're extremely vicious and can, can kill uh, things much bigger than they are because they're working cooperatively. Yeah, so I feel sorry for your tarantula. <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions? Yes. What limits are there on how small insects can get? They can get very small. Uh, the smallest insect is actually a hymenopteran, a tiny little parasitic wasp. Uh, and we're talking about something that can do a jig on a, you know, the head of a pin, basically. Um, so they can get very, very tiny. In fact, it's the tiny... Uh, yes, yeah, there aren't any as, that are as small as the smallest mites, correct. But uh, there are some very tiny insects. And in fact, that's where I think the coolest insects are oftentimes. I have trouble sometimes getting my students to pay attention to those tiny things, but that's uh, where I think some of the, the coolest stuff is. Yes. So why isn't that scorpion sting you? Uh, because it relies mainly on its uh, pincers. Uh, it is just, it's not very toxic. It uh, is basically evolved to, even though it has a, a fairly uh, prominent looking stinger, uh, it's evolved to the point where it doesn't use it very often. It can. It could if it to. Sure, it could if it wanted to. Uh, but the, it's, you know, basically going to try to pinch, pinch me with these uh, pincers before it would ever try to sting me. I'm going to put my hand over it because he likes to be in the dark sometimes. Yes? If he, wanted, the pincers aren't strong enough to hurt. Uh, if he really wanted to, if you look at those, uh, he could grab me but you know, like maybe between my fingers or something like that and that could hurt. But he'd, he wouldn't be able to grab a hold of a finger or something. But they're pretty powerful. Yeah. Yes? Can cockroaches slide through things? Like what kind of things? Uh, there are some cockroaches actually that uh, are good at, at, I don't know if I want to say burrowing, but moving through the dirt. There are even roaches that are actually found inside of ant mounds that live with ants, some really tiny ones. So roaches can, can live in a number of different places like that, yeah. Yes. Yes. Uh, the tarantula. Well, this is a scorpion. <laughs> You're pretty brave. <laughs> Tell you what, if you put your hand low to the ground so that it won't, if it falls off, uh, it won't, uh, you don't have to put it right on the ground, but just that way if it falls. And you got it. This is a brave girl here. <laughs> How about we have a holding uh, petting zoo afterwards, maybe? <laughs> <laughs> Actually, scorpions can be quite tasty, but you have to remove the stinger. I'll let some folks, I'll let you hold them maybe after we answer a few more questions. Yeah, how about a couple more questions from John? Somebody has that? Yes. Okay, so why does it seem people wingspan dragonflies anymore? Well, that's a good question. Uh, yes, why don't we see 28 inch uh, dragonflies in the world anymore? Um, there actually was an article in the New York Times, some of you may have seen, fairly recently addressing this. Uh, one of the ideas about why insects got so big in prehistoric times was that the concentration of oxygen in the environment was substantially more. Whereas now it's around 21%, it's 33% or so um, back in prehistoric times. And it turns out that the way insects respire are through, and arachnids and things like this, are through a series of spiracles along the side of their body they don't have blood carrying oxygen to their tissues, rather these tubes just keep branching off. So they get smaller and smaller and smaller, and they have to deliver oxygen directly to the cells. Well, the concentration of oxygen is 
uh, the, the, the less the concentration of oxygen, the harder it is to penetrate further and further and further because you're, gas, you're losing more and more oxygen. So the idea is that in an oxygen-rich environment, insects perhaps could have grown a little bit larger. Now, some people can test that, but that is uh, um, one theory behind it. Uh, what would take so much time? I mean, you know, we're talking about evolution over, uh, uh, you know, millions of years, yeah. Okay, uh, the young man, yes. How does an ant lift things twice the size? Uh, oh, that's a really good question. He asks, how do ants lift things twice their size? Uh, well, it's kind of a relative thing. The small, you know, something small like that basically... Uh, they have strong muscles, but it's, it's a, a size issue. The smaller you are, uh, the more you're able to lift. It's kind of a, uh, one of those weird things of, uh, of well, I don't know, science, I guess, or physics. Uh, so because of the ant's small size, uh, relatively, it actually gives them the opportunity, along with strong muscles, to be able to lift something uh, quite a bit heavier than it is itself. Well, let's uh, thank John. <laughs>